Welcome back to episode 4 of the Ultimate Iron Man Skiller series. Last episode, to say the least, was a fruitful one, leaving us off with completing well over 7 million firemaking experience, overcoming the hurdle of completing Merlin's Crystal with zero combat experience, and unlocking the most useful area of the build, Fossil Island, and summarized all of which has been completed in such a particular order to help propel us directly into episode 4. Firstly, I'd also like to mention the fact that if you haven't watched the previous episodes, I urge you to pause the video and begin from episode 1. This will ensure that you're all up to date with what exactly we've set out to achieve during the series. Now with all that stated, let's get right underway with episode 4. Carrying on from the previous episode, we're getting stuck right into Winter Todd to hopefully finish off the Pyromancer's set to then open up an array of content. And finally, after 94 fire making, we achieved the elusive Pyromancer Boots. Seeing that we've finished all of our early level construction training, it's now the perfect time to shift our house to Tavoli, which is considered the most efficient house for late game construction training on a UAM skiller. After despawning our necklace during cleaning specimen, I felt it necessary that I get a fashionscape touch-up until we get 64 thieving for the Xerix talisman, therefore the yin yang necklace will have to do in the meantime. In between Winter Todd and Birdhouse runs I got the occasional clue scroll, with the intentions of passively clearing all the stash units and hopefully obtaining some storable items along the way. Unfortunately this also meant we managed to hit a few roadblocks, with some items that we needed for the stash units, which then led us to an alternative method of training for smithing. Seeing that our inventory is half full, making plate bodies on Karanja would be a considerable waste of time, so our second best option would lead us to fixing the broken struts throughout the worlds in Motherlode Mine. Moving on to mining, we've chosen a more unorthodox method discovered by my friend Lalo, which nets around 20 to 25k experience per hour. Now what makes this method special is that you'll gain a passive 4 to 6k crafting experience per hour, sacrificing a measly extra 5k mining XP, resulting in a much more diverse pool of development. And as you can see, the limestone can be cut between ticks, making crafting virtually zero time, in which I'll continue to level 40. Now that we've gotten both 40 mining and smithing out of the way, we can now successfully mine and craft any piece of jewellery needed for an easy clue scroll, further helping towards all of our clue scroll needs and storage in general. Sadly we received nothing of importance from this particular clue, though at this stage we're primarily just doing this to complete our storage. Shifting our focus back towards Winter Todd, as a UIM we're typically locked to a chosen stat we're training until we're either finished or run out of supplies. Now adding further restriction to combat allows us even less room for variability between stats. Therefore I've devised a plan with all the goodies that are locked within my looting bag to route seemingly the most efficient path in development utilizing everything we have to offer. Though firstly we still have some passive skills and chores we gotta complete between each and every game of Winter Todd in preparation for actually opening the bag, as we do have to be extremely meticulous when it comes to inventory space, as we can't get another bag so easily. Between each and every game from 94 to 98 we'll be focusing on super compost and birdhouse runs to at least get us over level 30 farming for the Enlightened Journey quest, acting as one of our most frequent use of transport in the game. Now the importance of Enlightened Journey is to do with its storage and the fact that we have each and every type of log within our looting bag that will end up relocating into our log storage to clean up more of our inventory space. Unfortunately, seeing we have a restricted inventory, I ended up dropping all the valuable items to the boys in Limited CC. Who got it? <laughs> <It's> fucking <retard. laughs> Here's the first genuine solo I've had in a while, lasting a good 45 minutes while receiving 95 fire making and not missing a single brazier break at all. Now one of the things I thoroughly enjoy about the UIM game mode is the sense of seamlessness created when routing certain unorthodox training methods and to see the results in full effect, much like clearing the construction at such an early stage of the account, alongside a myriad of other stats as well. Which leads me to my next point, on why I deemed it more efficient to wear graceful as opposed to the Pyromancer's set. 
See, we have the goal of first achieving an untrimmed construction cape. It's paramount we prioritize construction XP over fire making, and we can achieve this by removing the set effect from the pyromancer's equipment. Thankfully, while having 80 plus fire making in conjunction with 10 hit points, we still lay under the threshold of passive damage, remaining a max of 1. This will ensure we gain a more healthy amount of construction XP while training to 98 fire making. Here we are with 97 fire making. Now the great thing about this is the showcase of the split experience you can see between construction, wood cutting, fletching and fire making, all through solos. This will help showcase the actual expected max amount of variable experience possible. And finally we achieved 70 construction. I doubt we'll get any higher during fire making though you must remember this was obtained entirely passively, which should typically follow the intentions of any starter ultimate iron man or woman. Alright, so I came across this cluster of boosters. Mind you, this clip was recorded immediately after the BH3 release. So then I did some investigating, and look at the state of this actual trash. It makes me thankful this account will never have to engage in PvP. After a few extra games of Winter Todd, we've finally achieved 98 fire making, where we'll call it quits while taking into consideration the clear cut goal of an untrimmed construction cape. And I am absolutely pleased with the outcome and effort that I put into prioritizing solos for more construction XP, ultimately saving a significant amount of time in the future. I can truly say if any of you guys are considering in making an Iron Man, restricted or not, the first thing to knock out is Solo Winter Todd. Now that we're out of the Winter Wonderland, our greatest priority is our looting bag, and what we're going to do with the contents that resides within. Now this is where it becomes incredibly meticulous, as you don't want to technically waste anything, as it's all been put there for a specific reason. So we must deal with one of the final NPCs we'll need our poison dagger for, the zombie. And as you can see I have one alt killing the southern zombie and another holding the aggression of the other two, trapped around a pipe in the top right hand corner. You may have also noticed I've used the last man standing stat smuggle showcased in the previous episode, so if you want to see how that's done make sure to give it a watch after this video. Now, the first item we'll have to part ways with will be the Tome of Fire. We have absolutely no need for it, we just used it for storage for the burnt pages to then be transferred to the main later. The time has finally come to let go of the bag, and scale down the inventory as much as possible. Thankfully, I've done some calculations on the side on the most efficient ways of dealing with what comes out of the looting bag. Now, the way we'll be playing is with an online alarm clock that rings every 45 minutes, giving us plenty of time to get back in the case of anything unforeseen happening. Firstly, we'll deal with some of the quicker items we can get out of the way, such as limestone. As mentioned before, the limestone may be cut into bricks between ticks, and this should take us no longer than a few minutes to clear, freeing up our second inventory space. Moving on to the emeralds, which we have no future use for, so we'll simply be cutting these then selling them to the general store. We'll also be doing this in Catherby, as it has one of the closest general stores to the bank, making it a little more efficient. We'll deal with the rubies a little differently. For those who don't know, the rubies can actually be cut, then given to the curator in the Varrock Museum as payment for the medallion. Now this doesn't typically do anything for our build, as it is a form of transport into Mauritania, however it is something niche you should do in the case you are ever to feel like altering your account build. By cutting all of our limestone and gems we've achieved 40 crafting, which will definitely help us when moving on to hardwood birdhouse runs. As you can see, some of the items will end up spilling over our inventory, which leaves us with little time to clear as much as we can, so our tree seeds will be planted consistently until we have the requirements for a seed box, saving us an extra 5 slots. Now moving on to our maple logs, I'll simply fletch these into unstrung longbows to then be sold to the Catherby General Store, quite similar to the emeralds. One of the only set of stored items that I regret would have had to be the fish, and if I started with a little higher cooking it would have been more efficient to simply cook the fish after the game outside Winter Todd. 
And if I were to do this again, I would have switched the trout and salmon out for Renar seeds and stored my magic logs, opening up an extra inventory slot. The silver will simply be smelted, then crafted into tiaras, granting 12 smithing XP and 52.5 crafting XP per ore, which will take no longer than 45 minutes. Like I mentioned before, everything from the bag will be used, and the same goes for the saltpeter, which will be utilised to make sulphurous fertiliser, granting us with favour in the host city's house, getting us closer towards the use of mess hall in the future. And as for farm runs, we'll be doing both tree runs and birdhouse runs, with super compost being made in the process. For the following step, we'll be making cannonballs, and we'll actually need these in the future, so thankfully this will still open up a single inventory slot for us. Also, if you have access to a bank and are into collectibles, both the toolkit and these railings can be banked. When fixing the railings, the repair rate is scaled off both your strength and crafting level, so a cheeky way to increase this would be to simply smuggle the LMS boost while fixing the fence. Also, while I'm in the area, I'll unlock the Barbarian Assault minigame teleport for ease of transport on the way back. And when purchasing the cannon, make sure to go through the dialogue as opposed to buying the cannon pieces outright, which will save you around 50k. You can then place your cannon wherever you like, letting it despawn, as it can be reobtained by simply talking to Nelodian whenever you need it. And as you may have guessed by looking at our inventory, similar to the tiaras that we made, we'll be making cannonballs in which we'll have a high priority use for in the future. At this stage my inventory is pretty much full with no overflow, which means we can transition nicely into completing one small favour up to the point where we can create the Guthix Rest, one of the most important items we'll need during the account. Before we get underway we'll start by cleaning our grimy herbs, which we can then re-note by cleaning them on the way back to the tool leprechaun, and as far as I know this is probably the most ideal location to do this. After speaking to Sandfew midway through one small favour, you'll get given the recipe for the Guthix rests, in which we'll need around 30 to 40 for certain quests in the future. Furthermore, it'll also turn three inventory slots into just one. And to get rid of the surplus herbs, we'll be making both compost potions and unfinished Guthix rests, gaining 15 Herblore XP per cup, as we don't actually need any more rests than we already have. Now finally, that will conclude the content of the video. Next episode, we'll finish up the consolidation of the inventory and move on to certain quests and achievements that will help in the progression of the account. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to drop me a like and a subscription. Also, make sure to hit the bell icon to notify you as soon as I've posted a video. This will be a great help to me, as the YouTube algorithm is a maze to say the least. I'll also display my Twitter handle on screen, and it will be linked in the description. I can simply say follow me on this platform as I post tidbits most frequently on here. And if you have any further questions, post a comment down in the comment section. I will see and reply to pretty much all of them, so don't be afraid to ask anything. And finally, as always, stay safe and take it easy.